for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Sunday morning, December 28, 1980. Lake Hamilton Bible Camp and Conference Ground Midwinter Camp Meeting being held in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Lee Ellen Wood is the teacher of the morning. Subject for the next three tapes is The Four Living Creatures of Revelation. And this tape is entitled The Eagle. This is Sunday morning. Usually on Sundays we say the official things, you know. So I just want to take the opportunity of saying a few official things. First of all, I want to thank Pauline for her wonderful hospitality. And she's given us her home over there during our stay. It's very comfortable. And we just thank you in the name of the Lord, Pauline. Praise the Lord. I want to thank Brother and uh, Sister Miller for their graciousness. And it's always a joy to come whenever we can to renew fellowship and talk things over and see what the Lord's doing. And I just love these people very much. I'll tell you one thing, when you uh, come into the forward things of God, you're going to be controversial. I'll probably be controversial this morning too, maybe. But we're going to be controversial. Speed over here is controversial. He's uh, an iconoclast. You know what that is? That's a big word. I see a dictionary back there. You can go and look it up. Maybe I shouldn't say that. No. But um, he's an iconoclast. An iconoclast is a chopper downer. Gideon was one. And um, you always stir up trouble when you chop down uh, people's gods and idols and trees, you know. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Just to want to say again, I appreciate Brother Speed this morning. Sometimes when you are, you know, billeted with some other people and you don't know them, you wonder ahead of time what they're going to be like. But I want to assure you that uh, Brother Speed, you know, was... Uh, see, I, I kind of had a picture, you know, that he didn't talk, he barked, you know, being in the Marines. And I haven't heard him bark at all. <laughs> I thought maybe, you know, he's going to get me up at four in the morning and make me go out and do calisthenics. Is that the time they get up in the Marines? I don't know much about all, all this. Five. You know, out in the cold, it was going to be merciless and make me go through calisthenics. But uh, it's been just very agreeable. fact is, I think the most violent thing I've seen him do is to peel a banana and eat it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He's a real Christian gentleman. Praise the Lord. I would kind of like to have known him, you know, before he was saved, you know, before and after picture. But I've appreciated him very much. Praise the Lord. Also, I'd like to say one other thing. I'm not, I'm not a good money raiser. When people are raising money, they never call on me. And uh, I can understand why. But I, I do believe that we should have the needs of this camp upon our hearts. And I just want to urge you to give freely to the camp here. Now, some of you are isolated. I know because some of you get the itinerary and, and uh, you have no church to go to or perhaps you are a home group. And I believe it would help the camp here a, a great deal if uh, you would just send them a, a certain amount every month, $5, $10, $100, whatever, and just let it come in every month. And I think uh, we ought to just stand and pray about this here in just a moment and ask the Lord just to release the funds that are needed. Um, I haven't checked this out, but I heard the other day somebody, somebody was talking about uh, Malachi where it says to bring the tithes and the offerings into the storehouse. And uh, like I said, I haven't checked this out, but they said that the storehouse in the Hebrew is an armory. Is that right? Have you heard that before? It's an armory. And certainly this place is an armory. Praise the Lord. And uh, you might think about that. There are places that are now operating on, on um, at least a million dollars a week. And uh, people are just pouring in money, but they're almost anything but armories. And so uh, I believe it would be pleasing to the Lord if we would help in this armory. Praise the Lord. And so you folk pray about that and talk it over among yourselves when you're home. And, and uh, maybe you'd like to send just regularly. You know, the expenses in a place like this are really astronomical it mean, at least they are to me you know uh, when you when you talk about running the federal government that's something else but uh, 
Uh, I heard one time that their utility bills were running about, was it $1,000 a month one time when I was here? 1300 to what? June bill for the camp meeting, the electrical bill, was $1,378. All right. That's, just electrical. Yeah. That's a lot of money, you know. That's thirty, forty dollars a day just for electricity. All right. Let's just all stand and we're going to look to the Lord and just ask him to release the finances. Praise the Lord. Lord, we appreciate this place and we believe that it is one of the armories of the Lord. Lord, we thank you for those that want to be just not merely the footman in the army, but they want... Uh, to take a place of leadership and to lead others on into the battle. Lord, I pray this morning that thou wilt bless Brother and Sister Miller in a very wonderful way. When the battle gets hot, dear Lord, I pray that you will be there to strengthen them. We're not asking, Lord, that you lessen the battle, but that you give us the strength uh, to enter into it, O oh God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we're asking this morning that you will speak to hearts. Uh, Father, I pray that you... Uh, will help us not to look to man, but to look unto God, because we believe that you can work on people that don't even know anything about this place, uh, but uh, you can move upon them to give. We've seen this time and time again. But, oh God, we do pray uh, that each one of us shall feel a responsibility and shall uh, desire to help. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for your love and for your blessing. And, Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you will guide us and direct us in these days, because we need to be on tiptoes. And we need to be walking softly before God. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Perhaps uh, Brother and Sister Miller have certain uh, items. You know, I don't know how things go exactly. When Chuck Flynn was here, um, he had everything worked out so much a, a brick. And uh, I think at that time, a number of people were paying, you know, so much a brick. Maybe somebody would like to take care of the uh, air conditioning in the new building or the roofing or something like that. And so you folks just feel free and talk these things over with them. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right. This morning we want to talk to you a little bit about the four living creatures in the book of Revelation. Now, you're quite aware that there is a lot of controversy going on in these days about the structuring of the coming of the Lord. And many people have different views. And uh, these people aren't all bad people. Some of them have just known no other teaching than the old conventional teachings, which weren't very well based. Sometimes they even have good scholarship in back of them. Scholarship isn't always the answer, though, because uh, nearly all of the, of the divisions in uh, the Christian world have scholarship in back of them. This isn't really quite the answer either, to get better scholarship. And so there are these controversies going on. I tell people like this, God wants us to have the hope of his coming. And this has just about disappeared from among the Pentecostal people. I uh, don't want to talk too much about the coming of the Lord uh, because I have this other aspect I want to bring this morning. But Jesus said to be ready. He didn't say to get ready. He said to be ready. I think on another occasion I told you about uh, a lady over on the West Coast. Uh, she's not a mystic, very practical woman, and God had given her two dreams in succession. And the burden of each dream was to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Be ready. And uh, it made a great impression upon the assembly. The pastor had her give it in a Sunday morning service, the dream and vision that she'd had about the coming of the Lord. Remember, we told you there's a danger in watching the wrong clock. So many people have clocks. A lot of the things that we're saying, uh, again, I'm, I'm not trying to, to uh, sell the notes that I have back there, but many of these things are recorded in, in the booklet that we call The Seven Stars, and uh, we tried to document uh, some of our positions here. I think uh, just to start this morning, we'll put the two tabernacles up on the blackboard and uh, sort of take off from there, because we need a background for the things that we're saying concerning the four living creatures. Now, God lives in the realm of the heavenlies, of the spiritual, and I'm just going to be brutally brief in this. I sometimes wondered, you know, why God didn't tell us things just right straight out in good English, <laughs> but he, he didn't do it that way. And I rather suspect that uh, this is a hidden treasure, and it's for those that want to dig and labor 
There's a, a reward in it. So, it's something like this. See, when God brings forth truth, it's a birth. And um, there was a birthing of truth in terms of restoration around the first gate. You remember when the reformers came along and preached justification by faith. Truth was being birthed. And then when we come to the sacred building, the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the turn of the century, again, truth was birthed. See, this is the manifestation of the sons of God here. Let me take this off. And uh, so truth was birthed here. And uh, we're coming now to the bringing forth of a whole new body of truth that is connected with the next realm, the realm of the Holy of Holies. And it's being birthed. But a child is not birthed usually all in one instant. It's a process. And so we see that which has already been birthed, but that which has not yet come forth from the womb, we don't yet see. And so we need to realize this and be very patient with one another, because I believe as we move along that we're going to see the full truth. Sometimes uh, teachers converge, and this is a joyful occasion, and they all see the same thing the same way, and sometimes they diverge. But we need to love one another because we can squabble about the manner of the coming of the Lord, get into a bad spirit, and all miss the coming of the Lord. Because he that has this hope purifies himself. Praise the Lord. All right, so God lives in a heavenly structuring. And uh, we've given you all of this before. And uh, then because we do not have access, either corporeally or through our senses, into that realm of the Spirit, he has given a picture of it or an expression of it in what we call the mosaic tabernacle and then this is further developed in the temples each of the temples is built on the same plan and um, each of the temples has its own particular phase of the story to tell so this is the realm of the spirit this is the realm of the heavenlies this is the unseen realm this is the realm of earth this is the realm of the natural this is the realm of the material now satan is the author of chaos and at one time, the order on earth was, um, there was an, an order, a beautiful, perfected order upon earth. But Satan came in and he created chaos. Now, when we pray, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, we're praying that the divine order in the realm of the natural shall once again be restored so that it will be the reflection of the order in the spiritual. God puts sometimes very great truths into very simple words. And so I often think of that when I hear people uh, praying the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And actually what we're praying for is, is that uh, the rest of the chaos shall be removed. He's removing it bit by bit, little by little, in our lives and eventually in our surroundings until everything in the realm of the earthly is going to be brought into divine harmony. All right, now, here's where we live right now, spirit-baptized people. We're in the holy place. We came in the first gate, we got saved, we came in the second gate, and by one spirit we were baptized into the one body. This is the body of Christ's church. Now, I'm just giving you my understanding, my presentation of it. So here are the spirit-baptized people, but the holy place has been invaded by the enemy. And we've given you lessons along this line. And actually, men like Cain and Korah and Balaam, have joined the Pentecostal church. This is the Pentecostal charismatic full gospel realm. They've invaded it. And since they couldn't destroy it from without, they infiltrated it and are trying to destroy it from within. And we perceive this all over. In Revelation 2, we find that even Jezebel and her grandchildren have all come in and joined the church. In the Old Testament, we find that uh, uh, Athaliah's children, the grandchildren of Jezebel, came in and uh, they vandalized the temple in their day. But God had a, a little boy in there by the name of Joash, and he's a picture of that church within the church. And right under the nose of Athaliah, God is producing a man-child. And Jehoiada the priest brought jo uh, Joash back to the throne, and then together these two men purged the temple of their day. Joash was the king, and Jehoiada was the priest. And so the the royal priesthood, the kings and priests of their day, purged the temple, all of it. All right, so God is forming a people in here. We call this the man-child. And I'm just going to go through this very, very briefly, because I have a lot to say about up here. Now, when the Lord comes, 
in the first stage of his coming. The coming of the Lord is not a simplistic thing. It's a very complicated thing. You might as well know it. We have people in these days that want everything simple. Well, it's a nice idea, and I believe that there is always a simple approach to many of the things of God, so that even a wayfaring man, a tramp, a bum, he can understand the way of salvation. There's always a simple aspect. But the coming of the Lord is very complex, and the book of Revelation is the book of the second coming. The whole second coming of the Lord is described in the whole book of Revelation. The Lord appears in chapter 1, first to the overcomers. And finally, we see the heavenly city coming down. And at this point, the heavenlies and the earthlies are joined together. It says in that passage of Scripture that now is the tabernacle of God with men. And God is going at a future time, bring together the realm of the spirit and the realm of the natural and blend them into one. And there shall no longer be the barrier in between. This is all a part of the second coming. But in the first stage of it, as we see it, the Lord comes and he visits these overcomers. He gives them their changed bodies. I use the word change. Uh, some people say, well, we receive our glorified body. I don't think we receive our glorified or our glorification at this point. Now, this changed body is a glorious body, but there is an event called the glorification, which comes on down the line somewhere, I don't know just where, where we're going to be glorified together with him. We have a picture of this in the temple of Solomon. Remember that Solomon first built the temple, and then later on he beautified it. And I see a parallel here. Here I believe we receive a changed body, and it's going to be a glorious body, but further on down the line somewhere, there is an event called the glorification. Perhaps when all of the labor of the building of the temple is over with, all of the warfare is over with, all of the bloodshed is over with, then there will be this glorification. I always like to tell people, if I don't know something, I don't know it, because I think it's foolish to try to pretend we know things. All right, so there is then this experience of these overcomers, because these are the overcomers. They go within the veil, and then they come back. In and out. Malachi sees this, and he talks about this little remnant, and how the Lord says they're going to be mine in the day that I make up my jewels, and then he says you're going to return. And what are you going to do when you return? Well, if you return, this means you've gone somewhere. I believe that this is the going in through the veil. And then when you return, he said you're going to judge. Who are you going to judge? God's people, the apostates described in Malachi. You're going to judge them. And you're going to discern between the righteous and the unrighteous and all of those things. And he said that the wicked are going to be like stubble under your feet. And these are going to deal with the corruption that has infiltrated the church. All right, then when this is accomplished, I see the Lord visiting us again. And at this point, these overcomers go up. They ascend. And then they come down. Here they go in and they come out. Here they go up and they come down. Malachi tells us about this, going in and out. Jude tells us about this. Even Enoch saw uh, this, and Enoch was a, a good one to bring forth this truth because he was the first to come into a changed body. And so Jude quotes Enoch and says, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment. What is Jude talking about? Jude was not talking about the wickedness out here in the world. Jude was talking about the wickedness among spirit-baptized believers deceivers, false teachers, and all of these things. And so, while this is a little flock, it is also a great multitude. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment. And so when these overcomers have cleansed the church, now this is my understanding, and I just offer it to you for your consideration. After they have cleansed the church and brought the church back into divine order, that is, the body of the body, these are the head of the body with Christ. After they have done that, then we have Revelation 4.1, and we have the open door in heaven. And John, who is the representative of the overcomers, and I believe the head of the overcoming company, I believe he's going to be made the head, John ascends up here, and uh, he sees the throne room, the throne room in the realm of the Spirit, in the realm of the heavenlies. And he tells us what is in that throne room. Now, in the Old Testament tabernacle... The Holy of Holies was opened only once a year on the Day of Atonement. And I would suggest to you that uh, the Day of Atonement begins 
Down here we have the Feast of Trumpets, and the Day of Atonement begins in Revelation 4, 1, when a company of people go through the veil, the high priestly company go through the veil, and Joel sees this picture. He says, Awake the mighty ones, stir them up, the gibberine, and he said, Let them come up, and then he says, Let them come down, because over here there's going to be a great battle. God will draw all peoples into the uh, valley of Jehoshaphat. And so he says, Let them come down. The work of the Lord is before him. The coming of the Lord is not just the Lord throwing up his hands and saying, I sure made a mess of things. It's not that at all. His work is before him. And he loves this church out here because he gave himself for it. This is his bride. These are the sons of the bride chamber. He loved this church, and he's not through with it. He's going to purify it, and he's going to eventually bring it into the glory, and it's going to be the exhibition of his grace throughout eternity. And so there are two movements here. First, the cleansing of the holy place on this level. And then I believe there will be an ascension, Revelation 4.1. I believe that uh, uh, Paul, who is not only an apostle, but he was one of these sons of God in advance, he complained he was born out of due season. I believe it was really kind of a complaint. Uh, because uh, he was ahead of his time. And whenever you're ahead of your time, you have a lot of trouble. You all know that. And I believe that Paul was caught up into this area. And he saw things and heard things that at that time it was not lawful to understand. But I think at this time uh, it is being lawful. God is opening up this realm now, this understanding. And then in the book of Revelation, another picture of these people are the seven stars. And we see God sending forth these overcomers. And first they come with the trumpet judgments. And then they come with the bold judgments. And they purge the kingdom. Here they purge the holy place. Out here they purge the outer court, which includes not only people that don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but in the larger sense, it is the whole kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. All right, now, that's just my presentation, and this is kind of the background that I work on. I'm not going to ask if there are any questions. <laughs> Praise the Lord. What do we do with the eraser? Hmm? Oh, that's a good place to hide it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, I'm going to put just the one tabernacle on here, just to make it more simple. The thought of going through the veil is uh, increasing in prominence. Many, many years ago, you heard very little about going through the veil. And now in many places, people are talking about going through the veil. So sometimes we talk about these things, and then people will come and they'll say, but Brother Alan Wood, how do we go through the veil? How many of you have had that question? How do you go through the veil? All right. Uh, we've been telling you. I think every time that we've been here, we've given you one aspect of it on how to go through the veil. Um, we equate this with the coming of the Lord and later on the ascension. But how do you go through the veil? So we're just going to give you another aspect of it this morning. Now, when we come up into the Holy of Holies in Revelation 4, when that door is opened in heaven, we see the throne of God. I'm not going to read all the scriptures here. And then in the throne and around the throne are four living creatures. I'll just kind of put circles here. And then surrounding the throne are four and twenty elders. I'm not going to put all of these on here because I don't want the picture to be confused to you. But there are four and twenty elders. And then we find that the seven stars that we talk a great deal about also have a place before the throne. Now, these that are in the throne and the elders who are around the throne, we have no record that they ever leave the throne. Now, they're going to reign in the earth. And perhaps that is the time when God will bring the two structures together and the heavenlies and the earthlies will be united. But... Um, Apart from that, we have no record that they ever leave the area of the throne, and yet they do reign over the earth. Uh, let's say, for example, that uh, Queen Elizabeth will we'll use uh, the British thing here because they have royalty. Uh, Queen Elizabeth might never leave the, the precincts of Buckingham Palace, and yet from that place uh, she rules or she reigns over a great empire because she has representatives that go out. There's an organization. These seem to have to do with the great organization of God. But the seven stars seem to go back and forth. And uh, as we pointed out to you, they are sent forth at one point to cleanse the holy place, and then they're sent out to cleanse the outer court. All right. Now, these are a picture of the overcomers. Remember, only three people come to the throne. Number one is who? The Father. Number two, the Son. Number three is the overcomers or the man-child. And these come to the throne. 
Don't you believe the common teaching? I think this is another delusion, maybe a minor one, that every Christian is going to reign and rule with Christ. This is not true. Now, there's a degree of authority given, I believe, to, to every believer, even those in the outer court. But to come up into the high priesthood and to come up into the high authority is reserved for a company of people that will qualify. All right, so how do we qualify? Well, one way to find out is to look at these living creatures because they are in the throne. Now, we'll turn over to uh, the book of Revelation here because I, I uh, think it might be important uh, for you to uh, understand this. Revelation 4.1 this is the scripture we've been using, that after this, that is, after the cleansing of the church, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet. And uh, we're blending this teaching in with the Feast of Trumpets. And it says, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So in verse 2, immediately John said, I was in the Spirit. And John is the representative overcomer all through the book of Revelation. He's actually looking at himself many times without realizing it, I'm sure. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat up on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. I'd like to point this out to you. God has a great deal of difficulty, if you can say God has difficulty, in translating heavenly language into earthly language. Jesus said, you know, to his disciples, he said, I've talked to you about earthly things and you haven't understood. How can I talk about heavenly things to you? All the time, we are trying to, to make heavenly things fit into our earthly concepts. One great religion, for example, their concept of heaven is that it's a beautiful garden and it's full of beautiful women, everyone uh, 30 feet tall. See, they're, they're trying to, to uh, describe their idea of heavenly things uh, with their earthly concepts. And we do that, just almost unconsciously. And we need to ask the Lord to break us out of this barrier and help us to understand spiritual things in spiritual terms. So, God isn't a jasper and a sardine stone, but the substance had an appearance similar to these stones here upon earth. All the way through, you find this in the Word of God, or in the book of Ezekiel, and so on. And round about the throne were four and twenty thrones. The Greek word should be thrones there. And upon the thrones I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And uh, then we'll go on down to the sixth verse. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four living creatures. Now this word beast is very unfortunate. It's an unfortunate translation. It has nothing to do with a wild beast. Uh, the Greek word for wild beast is, uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly, theron, or something like that. Do you happen to know that one? Theron. And uh, it means literally a wild beast. And uh, it is used of uh, the demonic powers that were present when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness in uh, Mark's Gospel, description of the temptation. The wild beasts were there. Uh, it is used in connection with Paul fighting in Ephesus, it said he was a beast fighter. It's a compound verb there. And uh, it's talking about the demonic forces that he fought and had to overcome before the blessing of God was released in Ephesus. It's used in the book of Revelation in connection with the Antichrist and the false prophet. And so this Greek word, theron, is used in connection with demonic powers many times in the Scriptures. But this has nothing to do with that. The, the Greek word here is zoe. And it means literally the living ones or the living creatures, living ones. Nothing to do with a bestial nature aspect. It says that they are in the midst of the throne. And remember, the only people that come into the throne are overcomers. So here's another picture then, another aspect of these overcomers. They're in the midst of the throne and they're round about the throne and they're full of eyes before and behind. This speaks of perfect perception. In other places we find they have seven eyes. An eye that can see into the past. An eye that can see uh, into the future. An eye that can see into God. An eye that can see uh, into the heart of man and so on. Perfect perception. Now the first living creature was like a lion. 
and the second living creature like a calf or an ox. And the third living creature had a face as a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures had each of them six wings about, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. These are the first words that we hear emitted from the Holy of Holies when the Holy of Holies is open, when these overcomers come in. These are the first words, holy, holy, holy. How many of us this morning feel as though our lives are holy? We're talking to you about going through the veil. Holy. Boy, if the Holy Spirit were ever to make that word real to us and quicken to us, we would feel as though we're being fried or something. Holiness. All right, then they give thanks and so on. And uh, then uh, down in the ninth verse of the fifth chapter, they sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. This is a title deed to the earth. For thou wast slain, they're talking about Jesus here, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. This identifies very clearly these four living creatures as being people because they've been redeemed by the blood and they come out of every kindred and tongue and people and family, nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Very clearly then, these are identified as humans, people. These four living creatures then are people. Now, the book of Revelation is written in code. My personal opinion is that no one's going to really understand it except the overcomers because it is written to the overcomers. It's written in code. It's written in symbols. Now, a symbol does not necessarily mean that we're to spiritualize everything. I have a tendency to be a literalist. I suppose some of you have discovered that. And I don't spiritualize everything in the Scriptures. Now, just because the thing is symbolized, it's no sign that we spiritualize it. There's a difference here. A literal thing can be symbolized and still say, uh, and still be a literal. See, we are infested in these days in Pentecost with people who are coming in with metaphysical approaches to the Word of God. You don't have to believe, for example, a literal Adam and Eve. That is just a story in the Bible uh, to... Uh, teach us a lesson. You don't literally have to believe that a great fish swallowed Jonah. That was just simply a story in there to teach us a lesson. This is the, the metaphysical approach to things. We're getting a lot of Christian science and unity mixed into the clear teachings of the Scriptures in these days, metaphysical teachings. All right, these are literal people. They are symbolized, but they're still literal. I still believe that God dwells in a literal habitation as far as spiritual substance is concerned, and he sees this in her vision. She sees him dwelling in a cloud. There's a, a literal place where he dwells somewhere, and yet his presence does fill the universe. But I'm not uh, a believer in pantheism uh, that his presence in substance is the whole expression of the Godhead. All right. And then, going back to the first chapter, to link this up, and the sixth verse, John, who is the type overcomer, says, in the sixth verse, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. And so John says that God has made these saints, including himself, kings and priests. And then you link this up uh, with the uh, fifth chapter. And uh, again, he says, uh, these four living creatures say the same thing. Thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests. So this high kingship and this high priesthood, which we have dealt with in other messages, consists of people. You say, isn't Jesus the high priest? That's true. But remember that whatever Jesus is, he extends and includes other people into it so that the one son becomes a many-membered son. This is true of that priesthood. It is true of the kingship. He is the king of kings, but he shares his kingship with these overcomers. And he demonstrates this in the symbols by bringing these four living creatures right into the very throne. Now, let's take a quick look at these living creatures here. We've already read this in verse 7 of chapter 4. One is like a lion. The Lord willing, we'll talk about that on uh, probably Tuesday. And the second living creature is like a calf or an ox. We'll talk about that, the Lord willing, on Wednesday. 
The third beast had a face as a man, and uh, we'll share this portion with the lion on Tuesday. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. This is a photograph of these that go through the veil. And so we study these four living creatures to find out the nature and the character of those that go through the veil, something that we work on right now. Praise the Lord. Um, at this point, I would like to, to uh, interpose this thought. Over in 1 Thessalonians, over in 1 Thessalonians, we find that we are to live in three tenses. Some people live in the past. The uh, Roman Catholic system is a religious system that dwells much in the past. And uh, they focus the attention upon, of the people upon uh, the crucifix. They make a great deal of, um, of the cross. And you have in the churches, for example, the, the stations of the, of the uh, cross, the Via Dolorosa, and all like that. Then we have a lot of people that dwell in the present. Now, in old traditional Pentecost, historical Pentecost they call it, um, we didn't uh, do all we should have done. We didn't talk about the interpersonal relationships too much. Our kids just grew up without very much training, and, and uh, we have people today that show this. And uh, we didn't really dwell on the things of the present too much. And then we have people that dwell on the future. I'm one of those that thinks a great deal about the future. I was in a church one time, and uh, the pastor that came in came in on a, a split. And uh, so I was questioning him about his ministry, you know, and what he brought to the people. And he said, well, during the past year or so previous, uh, he had spent a great deal of time upon the interpersonal relationships in the body of Christ. And he was trying to show the people what the body was and how we should come together and how we should flow together and, and so on like that and how the wound should be healed and how we should be one. And then his wife kind of blurted out and it was telling me something. I try to keep my ears open to everything, you know. She kind of blurted out. But she said, isn't there something more than that? Now, the charismatic move has focused upon the present. And they're all, all the time talking about the body of Christ as it is now, the function of the gifts, and the interpersonal relationships, and the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep, and so on. And uh, they're not thinking very much about the future. Now, the balanced Christian lives in the past, and he lives in the present, and he lives in the future. And I may be emphasizing the future, may be overemphasizing it, because other people... Do not emphasize it very much. There's a beautiful group of people that I minister to. I've been there several times. And uh, this is about my third visit to this place. And I'd never talked to them about the coming of the Lord, per se. And uh, so I began to open up and teach on the second coming of Christ. Now, this group of people, there were about a hundred of them, had uh, been very gracious to me and just loved me, you know. Every time I'd meet one of them, they'd hug me and like that, you know. And, and uh, just do beautiful things. When I was out of my room and come back, I'd find that one of the girls had, had gone out and picked some wildflowers and put them in my room, you know, just little things like that that expressed love. And so I was talking on the coming of the Lord, and I found that uh, they'd all frozen up on me, and I couldn't figure it out. Just opposite, you know, from what they'd been. So I, I began to probe a little bit, and I asked one of the young men, I began to probe, and, and uh, so this is what he told me. He said, well, we've been taught just to be good Christians, and then we're going to be ready for anything that comes along. The pastor had focused this group upon the present, how to get along with one another. And he had, they had no, no hope. See, the past has to do uh, with our faith. The present has to do with our labor of love. And the future has to do with our patience of hope. And so when I came along and began to tell them that Jesus could come at any moment, you know, this really upset them, made them very nervous. And they just kind of closed up on me. I still don't know how I'd come out with a group, but, uh, you, can, you know, you can only do what you can do and, and go on and try to do something somewhere else. But we need to live in those three tenses. We need to live in the past. And for this reason, we come back to the cross time and time again. We have communion. We remember Calvary. And we need to live in the present. We need to learn how to get along with one another, how to edify one another, how to build up the body of Christ. We need all of that, but we also need to look into the future because we have to prepare if we want to come up into the throne room of God. Right now, in the present, we have to prepare for the future. And so that's why we talk about these future things. All right, I want us all just to stand just a moment here now.
because we'll take off on the on the eagle, stand and just uh, jump up and down a little bit, the balls of your feet. Do it about ten times. That makes the uh, your heart beat harder, makes the blood circulate. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right, now we're going to study this lion aspect. One of these living creatures is like unto a lion. These living creatures are types of the overcomers or symbols of the overcomers. And one of them is like a, uh, is like a, uh, did I say lion? I meant eagle. Uh, no, lion. No, wait a minute here. The eagle. And we're going to study the eagle aspect of this. I always tell people to look at these photographs in the Word of God, and then if you see yourself in it, why, you're moving along. All right. If you don't see yourself, why, you know, got something to work on. All right, we're going to just go through a lot of scriptures quite fast here. The word eagle comes from the Hebrew nesher. Nesher. If you want to put it in English, it's N-E-S-H-E-R. And uh, it comes from the root nashar, which means to tear in pieces with the teeth and to rend. Tear in pieces with the teeth and rend. Mm-hmm. Comes the, the root is nashar, N-A-S-H-A-R. And the word for eagle is N-E-S-H-E-R, nashar. And it means to tear in pieces with the teeth and to rend. Now, the Bible is full of warfare. The Bible is a book of wars. We've never taught about Abraham here yet, but we carry the spiritual genes of Abraham if we are truly the children of Abraham. And Abraham fought the first recorded war in the Bible. And he came against the king of Babylon, the devil. These people that God is bringing forth as overcomers are warriors. And they're symbolized here by the eagle, and the eagle is a creature that tears in pieces with the teeth and rends. Of course, an eagle doesn't have teeth, but that's the meaning of the root. Sometimes people have objection to the type of message that we preach sometimes. I ran into this a while back, and uh, I want to tell you something. We're coming into bloody time. If you're squeamish, now's the time to back out. You can be one of the sheeps down here. I put that S on purpose there. I'm thinking of a man who said he always wanted to be one of God's sheep. He was from Europe. Didn't know English very well. All right. This, this is the place of the sheep. But uh, if you want to come up here, you are an eagle and a lion, a bird, an animal of prey. Guts are going to be spilled. Blood's going to gush. In this meeting recently, a lady spoke right up in meeting and took exception with me. And she thought I shouldn't talk in these terms like that. We were talking about Yael, you know, cutting off the head of Sisera. Oh, I just love that story in spite of it all. And she thought the children wouldn't understand it. Actually, she was having the problem, not the children. And she wanted me to uh, speak to the children after the meeting and try to explain all of this to them, you know. And so I said, okay. So after the meeting, 10 or 12 of the kids came around, and I tried to explain to them that... Uh, uh, killing under the direction of God was not the same as murder, you know. And you know, the kids were bored. And they began to drift off. They accepted the story as it was. She was the one that was having the problem. We're coming into days of great violence. Hallelujah. And this is symbolized here by the eagle. We're going to tear the enemy. We're going to devour him. Later on when we come to the line, we're, we're going to find that we're actually going to drink his blood. Of course, this is a symbol. Days of great violence. This is all that the devil understands. All right. Now, the eagle is oftentimes a solitary bird. If you see two eagles together, they are probably mates. But more likely than not, he's apt to live in a solitary fashion. You'll find that if you're among those that go up into the Holy of Holies, you may have kind of a solitary life as it relates to other people. They won't understand you. You'll be solitary. Did you ever study Bible ornithology? We'll expand on it just a little bit, you know. Not, not all God's believers are, are um, eagles. Not all the birds that fly through the air are eagles. Yet chickens. And the chickens are always going, always looking at the ground. And the chicken doesn't understand the eagle at all, Glenn. Just didn't understand him. Did you ever notice if you have a chicken... Uh, in a cage or in a sack or something and, and uh, he's all excited you know and everything but the moment you let him out 
He goes right to work, pecking on the ground, you know, trying to find another bug. Some people are like crows. Crows have conventions, and I'm, I know at home we have crow conventions there. And they come in by the hundreds sometimes, squawking, you know, squawking and squawking. You remember that in the valley? Did you have crow conventions up your way? We, we had uh, out our way. Maybe we have more olive trees out our way or something. And they would come in there, and uh, the eagle would look down at them, you know. Hmm, what are you doing, you know? He's just a different kind of a creature. We have the English sparrows, and they're flitting here and they're flitting there. They don't understand the eagle. We have the peacocks. The peacock looks at the eagle. He doesn't understand it. We've got peacock Christians, you know. Yeah, you can go on and on here. The eagle is something in his own right. And because he is what he is, he's often left alone. He's just solitary. Do you want to go through the veil? Maybe God is appointing some of you to be somewhat solitary. All right, the eagle is swift. I'm giving you excerpts of verses here. Second Samuel 1.23, speaking of Saul and Jonathan... They were swifter than eagles. This was a compliment. They did things with dispatch. Maybe they raced against each other. Maybe they uh, uh, competed with each other in shooting arrows or so on. They were swifter than eagles. Genesis twenty-eight forty-nine. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth. Speaking of Babylon. Jeremiah four thirteen. again speaking of Babylon. His horses are swifter than eagles. Jeremiah forty-eight forty. Concerning Babylon, he shall fly as an eagle and shall spread his wings over Moab. Lamentations 4.19, our persecutors are swifter than the eagles of the heavens. So the eagle becomes the symbol of swiftness. Now remember over in Ezekiel we have the four cherubim. And when people read these two passages of Scripture, uh, the ones in uh, uh, Ezekiel 1-3 to and the one in Revelation 4 and 5, they think that they are the same creatures. They are not. The cherubim were never redeemed by blood out of the inhabitants of the earth. They were created beings. We could show you this by going into the roots and so on there. But they are similar to these. Why? Because I believe they were created to fill this position until the time should come that the sons should come and take their place in the throne and round about the throne. So they are similar. So the characteristics of the cherubim are similar to the characteristics of the four living creatures. But they are two distinct people. And I believe that, uh, that when God's uh, overcomers, his man-child, whatever you want to call him, comes up into the throne, the cherubim are going to have to vacate the place and stand back. And these overcomers will take their place. All right? These cherubim were swift, too. They had that swiftness. Remember when we talked to you on the second coming of the Lord here one time, and uh, we gave you that Hebrew word, ra'ash, there was a rushing. Hallelujah. They move swift. These sons that God brings into the throne are going to have swift movements. See, God has a great big kingdom to, to manage. And uh, his throne, you know, we're talking about things we don't know too much about. But his throne isn't necessarily just in one place. Take, for example, our galaxy here. We've got 100 billion suns in our galaxy, besides all the moons and the meteors and... 100 billion and all the planets and everything God's got a a lot of property to look after hallelujah his throne is a portable throne remember in the Old Testament the kings had portable thrones Uh, they were placed upon their chariots the chariots were specially built this is that same picture in Ezekiel we read about those wheels these that come up into the throne are connected with these wheels swift movement in Ezekiel, the cherubim went like a flash of lightning. Like that, you know. I don't want to get hung up here. I go on quite a while on this swift now. But this is a picture of these suns. And when it comes to the mind of God to be over on the other side of the universe to look after some star, some sun that's getting burned out or something, uh, it's just in his thoughts. And these suns who are his throne, the bearers of his throne, just like that, they take him over on the other side. He can't wait for a hundred million light years to get there. Hallelujah. See, we have this dear brother here called Speed, you know. There's going to be a Speed Miller, too. What's your name? Huh? What, what's your last name? Short. Short? All right. Speed Short. <laughs> 
just just put C before your last name here, you know. Uh, those that come up into the Holy of Holies are going to move faster than light. Hallelujah. Fact is, they'll be moving along, and here's a, a ray of light, and he's kind of dragging his feet a little bit, and they can catch a hold of him and, and you know, multiply his feet a million times. These eagles are swift. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. They can move back and forth from the realm of the natural to the realm of the spirit. God has so much out there, and man just hasn't even begun to scratch the surface on his understanding of the universe, the natural universe, let alone the spiritual universe. They're swift. All right, the eagle has keen sight. Job thirty nine twenty nine. Her eyes behold afar off. Keen sight. That's why these that God is apprehending in this day are beginning to look afar off. You're beginning to see up into the Holy of Holies. You don't see it very well yet, but the closer you get to it, the more clear it's going to become. The eagle sees afar off. The eagle doesn't neglect the past. And the eagle doesn't neglect the present. But he lives in that third tent. He lives in it. And he sees it far off. There's a peculiar thing about the organ of the eye in the eagle that, I, I, as far as I know, is found in no, in no other creature. It has double eyelids. And the inner eyelid is the membrane that is pulled over the eyeball. And because of this inner eyelid, it can look directly into the sun and not be blinded. That's God's eagle people. They can look directly up to God. Not in presumption, in arrogance, haughtiness, but in love and desire. Oh, God, bring me to your bosom. Bring me to that holy place. Right up to where Praise the Lord. The eagle nests in high places. Job thirty nine twenty eight. She dwelleth and abideth on the rock, upon the crag of the rock, and the strong place. Jeremiah 49, 16. O thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, that beholdest the height of the hills, though thou shouldst make thy nest as high as the eagle. Obadiah 4. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation are high. God's eagle people love the high places. You put them down in the gutter, and they're very much ill at ease. They don't like it down there. They don't like digging around out at the city dumps. Remember when you was a kid, you know, especially you men here, you like to go out to the city dumps to find out, you know, to find things. And to the chagrin sometimes of your mother and father, you'd be dragging some old thing home. How many of you men have ever done that when you were kids? We're at a beautiful city dumps, you know, out where I lived when I was a kid. We used to like, but the eagle doesn't like that. The eagle wants up there where the atmosphere is clear, where the flying is free. Let the old crows go out to the dumps and dig around. Let them do it. Let the eagle people, they want the heights. Praise the Lord. This will speak many things, uh, things I believe to our hearts. All right. The eagle is a bird of prey. Habakkuk 1, 8. Thou shalt fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. Job 9, 26. The eagle that hasteth to the prey. Revelation eight thirteen. Now, here's something interesting, and uh, you should make a note of this. Then I looked and I heard a lone eagle flying in mid-heaven. The King James says an angel, but the Greek says a lone angel flying in mid-heaven. That's one of these sons out on a mission. And he cried with a loud voice. That's the trumpet again. Alas, alas, alas for the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining uh, trumpet blasts of the three angels who are about to sound. This is found in the Berkeley Version. He appears before the dragon. The serpent fears the eagle. He is placed in opposition to the dragon. He's a bird of prey. He's after the snakes. Right now, the snakes that are around fear the eagle people. Right now, God is getting his eagle people in practice. He's letting them have the little snakes, and pretty soon he's going to give them a dragon. How many of you vote for that? Proverbs thirty seventeen. The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall push it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. The bird of prey. Proverbs thirty nine twenty nine, uh, From thence, that is, from the crag of the rock, uh, she seeketh the prey, the mother eagle, and her eyes behold afar off. Her young ones also suck thine up blood, and where the slain are, there is she. See, you're not going to sit around knitting when you get up there into the glories or on the way up either, 
and uh, discussing, uh, you know, the latest book of the day. And you're not going to be drinking tea and pushing cookies. These people are birds of prey. They've got a victory to win. They're going to drink blood. Matthew 24, 27. For as the lightning shineth from the east unto the west and so on, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This is talking about the day of the Lord. It doesn't have reference to lightning in the sky that goes bang, bang, bang like that. It has to do with sunrise. For as the lightning, would be a better translation, begins in the east and goes unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, we have two versions here. And uh, Matthew says, For wheresoever the carcass is, there shall the eagles be gathered together. This is talking about battle. The word for body here is the Greek word toma, P-T-O-M-A. I've thrown this out to you, I think, several times. I'll have to explain it now to you this morning. But the Greek word here is toma, and it means something that has fallen, a corpse. It has to do with battle. And God's eagle people, as it were, are going to gather like the eagles uh, to devour the carcasses of the enemy. Picture a great battle of field, and the battle is over, and the slain are there, and the eagles are there to devour the flesh. That's the toma. They devour the carcasses. They devour the enemy. This is a picture of victory. God makes these pictures of victory so vivid. It's as though you eat the enemy. You have so overcome him that he becomes food for you. What's that one they have about eating giants, you know? But um, Luke's gospel has a different version. In Luke's gospel, it says, but wheresoever the body, but here the Greek word is soma, a living body, thither will the eagles be gathered together. One gospel says, a dead body, the other says, a living body. Thither will the eagles be gathered together. What does this mean? Well, the scripture comes to my mind where Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And God's eagle people love the body of Jesus. And they love the blood of Jesus. And symbolically, they eat his flesh and they drink his blood. Remember that these people are going to dwell in the very presence of the blood of Jesus. Remember the other night that, that uh, Glenn told how Jesus gathered up that spilled blood and he deposited it upon the heavenly mercy seat. These people are going to live right in the presence of the blood. I can't imagine such a thing. Suppose that wondrous blood of Jesus were to be placed on a table in our midst here. What would happen to us? I think we'd fall on our faces, wouldn't we? When the Lord apprehends these overcomers, when he gathers the seven stars into his hand, he puts them right upon the male stars. The eagles eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of God. Praise the Lord. All right, so many things here. We've got to hurry up here. What time are you having lunch? Oh, i got uh, 26 minutes. All right. Oh, no. Ten minutes less than that. Well, we'll see how we come on. No. I can't get through in 20 minutes, quite. All right. A word about the flight of the eagle. Proverbs 30, 19. The way of an eagle in the air. Three things that are wonderful, yea, four. One of them is the way of an eagle in the air. Isaiah 40, 31. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Proverbs 23, 5. For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Exodus 19.4, I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. Now, there's something very unusual about an eagle. Most birds, you know, have to uh, uh, go horizontally before they can go up. The eagle can take off and just go straight up. I think this has something to do with this ascension one of these days in Revelation 4.1. And John is caught up into that open door. The overcomers, the type of the overcomers. There is that flight, right straight up. Uh, somebody's compared Christians, you know, to aircraft. And most times in our churches, we have to have a good, long runway. You know, we have to get all warmed up and everything. And get some songs going, you know, some fast ones, preferably. And then after a while, we finally take off, you know, about several thousand feet down the runway here. God has people... They don't need a runway. They're like helicopters. They can just go up like that. I'm sure Speed could tell us all about that, huh? Okay. And uh, these, huh? these eagles, 
they have a fight through the air. And they can take off and you can watch them until they disappear up there. They become a little dot and then disappear and they're still going. Praise the Lord. They have a flight that others do not have. Now, I want to talk about the training of the young. Exodus 19.4 You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Deuteronomy 32.11-12 As an eagle stirreth up her nest, or fluttereth. The same word is is used over in Genesis 1-2 where um, it speaks of the Holy Spirit hovering over the face of the deep and so on. Hovers over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him. Praise the Lord. Well, let's imagine a little eagle family here. And uh, here is uh, Papa Eagle, Mama Eagle, and Junior. So calling Junior. So it's Saturday morning. And uh, they have a very nice nest, very comfortable, Saturday morning. So here's Junior Eagle, and uh, he's just opened up a nice can of gopher meat, made himself a big sandwich, and he goes over to his water bed and gets the pillows all just right, you know, and uh, got the television up here. It's time now for the Pink Panther, and uh, what else do they have? I don't watch television, so you'll have to help me here. Roadrunner. And Yogi, what is, what are they calling Yogi? Yeah, Yogi Bear, you know, you know. All right, Saturday morning. And uh, he's just going to have a nice Saturday morning, you see, with his gopher sandwich and, and uh, all the television programs, one after another, coming right on like that. You know, it's going to be a wonderful day. And then he begins to hear some sounds around the house. And he says, Mama, what are you doing? Oh, she says, I'm cleaning out the refrigerator. So he looks over there, and here's Mama, and she's just tossing overboard that beautiful rabbit's head. Mama, don't throw away my rabbit's head. Uh, that was my nighty-night snack. Oh, well, son, we have to clean house once in a while. Well, he goes back to the pink panther, whatever it's on. And then he kind of is watching his parents. Mama, what are you doing? That's my skateboard. She throws it over, over the side there. Like that. Mama, what'd you do that for? That's my skateboard. Oh, you know, we have to clean house once in a while, Junior. And uh, so here's his parents poking around. And, and then here's uh, his, his uh, baseball card collection. Mama, what are you doing with my uh, card collection, my baseball card collection? And the Mama's just thrown them overboard, all 26,000 of them. And they're all fluttering down to the ground. Mama, what did you do that for? Mama, that was my collection. I had 26,000 of them and not very many duplicates. Mama, what are you doing? Well, Junior, you know, you're, you're kind of growing up now. And, uh, oh, so he's having a hard time. He can't even concentrate on, on uh, the Roadrunner anymore. The thing goes on. And uh, so he gets up, you know. And while he's up, Papa gets a hold of the waterbed. And throws it over the edge. Papa, what are you doing with my waterbed? Well, son, you know, uh, we have to change things around the house once in a while. But Papa, that waterbed was so comfortable. I could just sleep so nice on it. And the cushions, look, you've been putting them overboard, too. You know. And then finally, Mama gets something else. Mama, what are you doing with my teddy bear? Oh, he begins to cry. This is the climax. Mama! And Mama throws the teddy bear over the side. Down the cliff, and it goes. Mama, that, that's my teddy bear. I've had it ever since I can remember. And I can't go to sleep at night unless I have my teddy bear. Mama, what's happening around here? Well... Mama says, everything's all right, Junior. You, you'll find out. Your father and I have been talking it over, and, you know, you're growing up now, and uh, it's time for you to go to school. So, that night, poor Junior, the wind was coming up through the floorboards of the house, and in the morning he was just cold, and, and his poor little old body was purple with bruises, and so morning comes, and here's Papa sitting on the edge of the nest, and Junior in the middle, and Mama over here. See, God's making eagles now. And he said, Mama, I sure wish I knew what's coming off here. Well, she says, you know, your father and I decided that, uh, you know, it's time for you to go to school. Well, I hope it's a nice school. Do you think they have a sandbox there? And some swings? And a big plastic box for me to crawl into? Well, Mama says, it's, it's not really that kind of a school. Well, what kind of a school is it? Well, we're going to send you to flying school. Lion school. Mama, 
I don't want to fly. I don't want to fly. And so Mama gives Papa Eagle a wink. And Papa Eagle catches the little junior unawares and pushes him out of the nest. Mama, what's happening here, Papa? You, you threw me out of the nest. Oh, I'm falling. And, and he gives one of those screams, you know. And he falls. Oh, I'm going to get killed. I'm going to get killed. And Papa Eagle hollers down. He says, pull your parachute cord, you know. Get your, get your propellers going. And uh, here's this little eagle, you know, and he's going down like that, and he's, he's trying to flap, and, and not very much is happening. And then Mama gives Papa Eagle, or Papa Eagle gives Mama Eagle a wink. He says, your turn now. And here he goes down the, uh, I heard some talk, you know, the other day about progressions. What is it? You fall. Is it 13 and one tenth feet the first second? And uh, huh? then next is uh, 16 and one tenth and 32 and two tenths. And so now he's just plummeting to the ground. And here are the treetops looming up and, and uh, they all look like big spears. <laughs> uh, you get this impression, you know, when you're flying up in the northwest and look down on the fir trees, you know. looks like a lot of green spears. And so here is uh, Junior, you know. Mama, I'm going to get impaled in one of those trees down there. Help, you know. And so, Mama, just at the right moment, she holds down. And she catches him on her back. That's what he's talking about here in the Bible. He bears us on eagle's wings. And she swoops up, comes back to the nest. And he gets out just trembling. So they let him rest a minute. And they said, now, we're going to have class number two. <laughs> kind of the same thing over again. Class number two. I wonder if this explains anything to you about your experiences. Hmm? Does it? I see so many men in these days, and they're so intent on building nests. Now, the nest is necessary, but it's not the ultimate. You know, I... I don't know where these tapes are going. And when I'm with a body, I, I endorse that body. I do what they're, uh, uh, when they're functioning according to the scriptures, you know, I encourage them. And we should belong to a company of people. But you know, the ultimate is not the nest. God is making eagles. God's making eagles. And every so often, he comes along and he just throws us out of the nest. He throws the things out of the nest, and then he throws us out of the nest, and we yell and scream, and we have fear, and we're going to get killed. We're sure of it. But you know, just in the nick of time, our wonderful parent is there, and he lifts us up, and he lets us rest a while. Then we can have flying lesson number two. Hallelujah. 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 I've seen some of God's wonderful people, and they're going through almost unbelievable things. And tense and sorrow. I've seen sometimes a, a young husband who loved his wife just with all of his heart, maybe had a child or two, and the wife ran off with another man or something like that. I've seen these things happen. Uh, I'll tell you a little story here, just as near as I can remember. Uh, I heard a pastor tell this one time, and he'd build a beautiful nest. He'd come into a place, and he'd build up a congregation, and uh, everything was beautiful. The people loved him, and and uh, they were in a building program and the money was coming in and a prophet came along and said God was going to blow on it and I think in six weeks it would all be broken up. He says, can't be. And it was true. In about six weeks, things began to happen one after another that he couldn't control and his whole nest was just broken up. Why? Because God is not collecting nests. God is manufacturing eagles. I sometimes think about Dima Shikarian. The Armenian people are very industrious people and, and business-like people, and I'm sure, I, I'm just surmising here, that over in, uh, where did they come from? Oh, was it Turkey, Armenia? Mm-hmm. Turkey, but Armenia is what, part of Turkey? Um, all right, and I imagine they had beautiful farms and nice barns filled with hay and nice homes and everything. One day, God came along, and he broke up the nest. And you say, why would God do that? Everybody has a nice living here. Everything is so beautiful, schools and churches and everything. Because God had an eagle he wanted to bring out. We might not have had Dima Shakarian today if he hadn't broken up that eagle's nest. Thank God if you have a nest and appreciate it. 
But remember that someday God may touch it because he's not collecting this. He doesn't have a lot of myths up there in the Holy of Holies, but he has a lot of eagles. Now, just one more thought in closing. And uh, uh, the Bible talks about the eagle renewing its youth. It's kind of another aspect of the same thing. God deals with us in life in cycles. There are big cycles. Maybe you'll have three or four of these big cycles in your life. And, and then there are smaller cycles. He kind of deals with us that way. So here's one of God's eagle saints. He's just having a big time. God's given him a big ministry. Or maybe a small ministry, but it's a good ministry. And uh, maybe he can prophesy. Maybe he has a word of knowledge. Maybe he can work some miracles. and Everything is just going along fine. Maybe he has a word of knowledge. And then one day, something happens in this ministry. And uh, he flubbed it somewhere. You know. Maybe he prophesied over a widow and uh, said to her uh, that God's going to bless your husband or something. And she had no husband, you know. Something comes along like that. Well, we're kind of tolerant. One of his feathers has fallen out. But he's got a lot more feathers. So he goes on. But it isn't long before some more feathers fall out. And his ministry isn't working too good. And he's making a lot of mistakes. Maybe all the demons aren't yielding to him now like they used to. And so he thinks, well, I've got to do something about this. So he goes to the body shop. And he takes all these feathers along with him, you know. And he goes over to the body shop and he says, hey, look, uh, I'm losing my feathers. See if you can't stick them back in. So they work on him. Now, this actually happens. Over on Catalina Island, there used to be about 75 uh, Gold, what do they call them, golden eagles over there. And the numbers dwindled down to just a handful of them, or I don't know if you could say a handful of eagles, but anyway, just a few of them there. And there's a young man that became concerned about this, and I admire this young man. I uh, can't say I'd like to spend my life doing what he is doing, but at least he's not just out grubbing for money like most young people are doing in these days. He's dedicated himself to these eagles. And so when they find an eagle that has been hurt or isn't doing well or something, they'll create it up and bring it to him. And he'll work with this eagle. And he's developed a technique of putting the feathers back into the eagle. He actually bores a hole into the skin and inserts the proper feather in the proper place so he can get these eagles going again. And it works, you know. I mean, it's quite an interesting story. So here's some of God's uh, ministers, you know, eagle saints. And uh, they've just been going great guns, but... Now things aren't working so good, so they go to the body shop and uh, they want the feathers put back in again. But somehow, they don't work just right. And he starts losing feathers. And after a while, he's just all naked. A little bit of fuzz here and there, you know. Just all naked. He's so embarrassed. And people say, you know, have you heard about him? He used to have a big ministry at one time. I wonder what's happened to him now. The word says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall be like the eagle so the eagle I'm told finds himself a secluded spot a warm place in the midst of the rocks and he just goes there and he stays there stays in the sun just stays there quietly you know what happens after a while some new feathers begin to appear hallelujah little pin feathers begin to stick out and after a while, those tail feathers come in and those wing feathers come in. Every feather in an eagle has a special use. They're not like chickens. And so after a while, he begins to feel his youth coming back again. Only this time, he's a bigger eagle. And he's a better eagle. And he's a stronger eagle. And his wings uh, are more beautiful than they were before. And after a while, he lifts up his wings and he flies out. And God brings this man into a new ministry. See, in the Hebrew, it doesn't say, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew uh, their strength. In the Hebrew, it says, they will exchange their strength. And what happens sometimes, in order for God to give us something better, he has to take away something inferior. So expect this in your life several times. This has happened to me probably, uh, in a larger sense, about three times in my life. And I'm molted. Nobody wants you around when you're molten. <laughs> they don't like sweeping up your feathers, you know. But just be patient. Get up there in the rock. Stay in Christ Jesus. Let the sunlight of God come upon you. He's not true with you. He's not going to be true with you until the last molt 
And then you're going to fly up into that Holy of Holies. Be one of God's eagles sing. God bless you real good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, Maranatha. Let's all stand. Have your eyes. shouted, Maranatha, praise the Lord, hallelujah, he may come at any moment, praise the Lord, let's be an eagle saint. This is the end of this message, our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com, there are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.